This is episode number 465 with Irene Fair, Rebuilding Libido for a Healthy Sex Life. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Weiner. Welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And if you want support on your journey to lasting love, I wrote a book just for you. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And here it is, if you're watching on video, it's filled with 30 tips, stories, and exercises designed to help you step more fully into your value. And you can find it on Amazon, in Kindle, or paperback. And every week I bring you a tip from the book. This week's tip is step number 26, which is learn how to delegate. I'm still working on this one, but <laughs> um, it is so important not to think we have to do it all. And in fact, it holds us back from the life we're meant to live if we think that we are the only ones who can do everything. And that means if you're a business owner or you're running a home or anything else in your life, look to support. That's where coaches come in. Irene is a coach who got certified in the same school I did. And, and it's really important to work with people to help you to grow. We can only grow a certain degree without support. And so my challenge to you this week is to delegate something. I don't care what it is, something, and just have somebody else do something that is not serving you well. And before I bring Irene on, I want to just give a shout out to my Facebook group. We are an amazing group called Your Last First Date, and we have monitors who monitor the group all day long, which is very different from most groups for women who are trying to find their last first date. We are not a place to come and complain. Oh my God, I, I, I'm a member of a, a number of groups where it's just a bitch fest. I mean, it's, it's like men are terrible, dating sucks, I'm never dating again. Uh, and it just goes on and on because nobody's nobody's monitoring. And so this is not a place for that. This is a place for growth, for personal growth, whether you're in a relationship or you're looking for a relationship and you're a woman over 40, come and join us at your last first date. And now for my guest, Irene Fair. She is a sex and intimacy coach. That's a hard word to say. <laughs> She helps couples in long-term relationships get better at intimacy and sex, and she is on a mission to dispel the dangerous myths about women's libido that can cause heartache and broken dreams. She is no stranger to these issues herself because she recovered from an all-too-common story of happy marriage turned sexless when she also lost her libido before turning 30. It doesn't often happen. So, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it does often happen. <laughs> Let's find out from Irene. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I, I love this topic because we don't get into it enough. And I think sex in general doesn't get talked about, but especially as women start to age and we have so many fears about libido and maybe there's something wrong with me and am I ever going to be able to have a relationship? So before we get into all the nitty gritty, I would love for you to share your story of that happy marriage that turned sexless. See yeah, like what, what happened? Like I said, it was an all too common story, or like you said it in the introduction, um, that our relationship was beautiful and wonderful and light and happy and filled with lots of sex in the beginning. And so it was a huge shock to end up in a sexless marriage later on. But now from the vantage point that I have, having coached hundreds of couples through same issues, it's not so uncommon. But again, at the time, as I was going through it, what happened was it started out so nicely, so beautifully, so light. And sometime along the journey, when our relationship got deeper, when we said, you know, we want to spend our lives with each other, we're serious, we really want to be with each other my libido started to tank. And it actually started with me first losing lubrication and then going to the doctors and the best doctors really in the country. And they said, well, it's natural for women to lose their lubrication, just use lube, it's not a big deal. So I listened to that advice and sex turned painful. And then my whole body just recoiled from touch. I didn't want to be touched. I didn't want to kiss. And I was terrified of any kind of intimacy gestures that would in any way imply that we should 
have sex. And so it all snowballed into me really disconnecting completely from my husband, who, the man who was my boyfriend became my husband by that time and completely shutting down and also being incredibly distraught over this. What did it mean for me as a woman, as a wife that I no longer not only couldn't enjoy sex, but didn't want it really like had no urge whatsoever. And it was incredibly painful personally, and it was incredibly painful. It was, it was painful for our relationship because I was suffering in silence. And we couldn't talk about this. We didn't know how to talk about this. And we were really young. This was uh, our, between like 26, 27. We lacked the ability to talk about it. And all of this is exactly what I see with couples now that I work with, it's almost a predictable pattern of what happens with couples when they connect and everything is going great, but at some point they hit a roadblock. It could be pain for her. It could be mismatched libidos. It could be having children and the, the shifts that naturally happen, especially for women, but also in the dynamic of the relationship and couples don't know what to do. And that's, one of the most painful things that we can go through as human beings in a relationship, that place where we feel so alone while we're together with a partner. And so that was my journey. And I took that, I, I decided, I, I kind of concluded that it was all my fault. It was me. I wasn't sexual enough that I had failed as a woman, as a wife, because I had lost my libido, which is one of the biggest myths and misinterpretations and uh, mistakes that we make when we look at scenarios like this. And that's, that's what my mission is today, to demystify these, to really help people understand what's happening and obviously to help them find solutions, to come back to each other, to come back to themselves and find their own authentic libido and their own authentic expression of sexual desire. Thank you for sharing your story. And I, I can totally understand why, why you had a hard time speaking about it, why you blamed yourself. And I mean, we just didn't have the language, you know, to, to be compassionate, to be vulnerable, to really understand that it takes more than one person to increased libido and I'm sure other things. So let's let's get into the um, some of these myths. You mentioned the myth that it's all a woman's fault. Is that, that one of the myths? It definitely, all the myths lead to that conclusion. Mm. And all of these myths also come from one source. And that is that so much of how we understand sex and what is acceptable in sex, how even therapy has been conducted, sex therapy, and how um, we've, we've conceptualized sex and sexual desire has been based on the way men experience it. Hmm. So going back to Freud, who thought that women were just sexually inferior, they were sexually broken to begin with, and he elevated men's sexuality to the level of the sexuality, this is how sex is, just the way men experience it. And that has reverberated through all these different areas. Our medical system that looks for, for example, that tests women for testosterone when they're complaining about low libido. Why? Because that's what is assumed drives sexual desire because that's what works in men. To sex therapy that um, comes up with tests and surveys that gauge women's libido based on the way men experience it, to the way we see movies and the way porn is designed to specifically speak to men's uh, way of experiencing sexual desire. So these myths are all based in this comparison and so many women, including myself, feel like we're sexually broken or the way I used to. It's because we're sexually broken compared to whom? To men, right? 
And so the first myth is based again in, in this comparison. And the myth is that our sexual desire should be spontaneous. And that's how men experience it. So Emily Nagoski in her book, Come As You Are, brilliantly mapped this out. And spontaneous sexual desire is, again, what most men experience. And what it looks like is they have a thought about their partner or their partner touches them, or they even see a billboard of a sexy woman. And within an instant, literally an instant, they have this thought, oh, I want sex. And within another instant, they can get hard and be available for penetration. So everything is happening spontaneously and quickly. Out of nowhere, they can get this sexual desire with a minimal amount of stimulus, and they can be ready for sexual activity. And that's what's called spontaneous sexual desire. And that's, again, the standard. This is how we see things in the movies. This is how we think about it, spontaneously thinking about sex. Women have something completely different, what's called responsive sexual desire. And responsive sexual desire, just like the name implies, sexual desire is responding to the things that precede it. So for women, it's this whole journey that our bodies go through to reach sexual desire. And it starts with a lot of different factors, like how connected the woman is to her own body, how connected she is to her own pleasure. If she is in work mode, trying to work things out, fix things, do things, she's probably not connected to her body and her pleasure. So she is responding to that. But once she switches to connecting to her body, responding to her pleasure, something turns on in her body. She relaxes or she's like, oh, I'm enjoying myself. It's dependent also on the connection between her and her partner. What's happening in that connection? Does she feel like she's important to him? Does she feel like he's paying attention to her? Is he playful with her or is he on his phone or talking about what he needs to do? Is she at the center of his attention? And there's also the factors of uh, contextual factors. Like, are there children pulling at her, <laughs> at her leg or sitting on her? And she has no... Um, really space of her own, her body is her children's in that moment? Or does she have that spaciousness? And are they touching? Are they playful? Are the kisses passionate? Or are they just this peck on the cheek, uh, obligatory peck on the cheek as they're walking out the door in the morning? Are they actually connecting? Are they touching? And is their touch without a goal? So if you take all these things and these things are happening, she's starting to feel like, wow, I feel really relaxed. I feel connected. I feel seen. Oh, I feel sexy because he's paying attention to me. And out of that starts, oh, I want to kiss a little bit more. Now I'm ready for a more sexual kiss rather than the kind of just, you know, on the surface kiss. And oh, now I want him to touch my body. And oh, now I want to touch him. And oh, now I want sex. So there's this whole journey that looks like a, a spiral where she's getting turned on and coming alive. And her sexual desire is at the end of that. But most women look at their men and think, wow, he's turned on, he's rearing to go. Why am I not? And when we get into that thinking, what happens? We shut ourselves down. Mm -hmm. Right, We get discouraged, like, oh, look, I'm not there yet, or I'm not there at all. There must be something wrong with me when there isn't. And so this myth that our desire should be spontaneous is a myth, and it's a dangerous one, because it makes women feel like they're sexually broken. Let me ask you a question, because this, this totally resonates for me. Uh, when I first got married, I remember talking to other women who were newlyweds about their sex lives because I was really curious. <clears throat> and so much happens behind closed doors that nobody ever talks about. Yeah, and so yeah. I had friends who were, who were scheduling sex with their husbands because they needed to have a sex. The husbands needed to have sex. The wives didn't really care. 
And especially when you're young moms, you know, that there's like you're talking about, like the, the desire when you're touched all day and you're, you know, nursing and doing all these things where your body is used for other, other reasons is not very sexy. So, <clears throat> so there were people who were scheduling it like every other night and this makes my husband happy. I saw a lot of, um, a lot of people having sex as, as like an act of keeping the peace. And so they weren't turned on, but they would do it anyway. And then you have all these sex therapists who say, well, schedule sex, you should schedule sex, right? So, so how do we make sense of that, that whole thing? Because, you know, I don't think it's healthy to have sex when you don't want to. Um, sometimes you could become more turned on by making time for sex, but I think there's a lot of misunderstandings there. Yeah. So what do you have to say? I love this question, and I'm very passionate about talking about this. I even have an article on my blog about this. I am very much against scheduling, against scheduling sex, precisely for the many reasons that you mentioned already, that women end up overriding our own readiness, that scheduling sex becomes about sex rather than about them and the connection between them which is the thing that actually would turn her on. So scheduling sex becomes a performance. It becomes a, a duty, becomes something that you do, that you, you act rather than actually engage and show up in, right? You show up in your aliveness, you enjoy yourself. That doesn't happen if you know that at eight o'clock, you have to show up. You may do some things to get turned on, but that's not genuine turn on. That's, that's kind of getting yourself ready. Okay, okay, I'm gonna do it, okay. But that's not sexy. And so what I see with this model is that it's a downward spiral for women. Yes, he may get his needs because he can spontaneously get turned on and it matches his way of being. But for her, it's a downward spiral. It's a, it's a process of diminishing returns because the body knows that this isn't genuine. This isn't real turn on. And that next time the body, which is very, very wise, will say, let's not do this again. So let's not get so turned on. And so she has to work even harder to get herself turned on. And then again, she's gonna get diminishing returns. She's not gonna enjoy herself more. And the body's gonna be like, look, don't do this again and shut down more. And again, it's more and more work for her, more and more performance, more and more overriding that she's tired or she wants, she's not ready for sex. She wants that play, she wants the connection, but she's gonna do it. And it's incredibly damaging for the woman. And ultimately it's incredibly damaging for the relationship because it's not connection, it's not connected sex. It's perf perfunctory and performance sex. And I want to, before I get to the solution or the diff a different way of doing this, I also want to mention that aside from fatigue, just straight up fatigue and being overtouched when you have young children and all of that and lack of sleep, the biggest libido killer for women is saying yes to all the things that we're not ready to do or that we don't want to do and becoming a shell of ourselves and just doing things, but not actually living, not actually being, draining our life force. But guess what? Libido is the definition of life, so, or life force. And if you are a shell of yourself and if you're drained of life force, you're not gonna have a libido. You're not gonna have that, that natural desire for, for sex and connection. Again, back to performance. But here's the good news, that the solution lies in scheduling, but scheduling something different. Schedule sexy time together. Schedule time to be with each other as lovers. And during that time, take sex off the table. It's about time to look at each other's eyes. It's the time to hold hands and be like the, the, the new lovers that you were in the beginning, being silly with each other, 
you know, what do we do when we start dating? We go to the movies, but who cares about the movie? We're making out. You know, we're going on walks and who cares about the walk? We're stopping and making out around the corner where no one is seeing, or we go on a road trip and we stop the car and who cares about the destination? We just want to make out in like a secret place. Reintroducing that, the play, the, the care, carelessness, meaning like not caring about responsibilities and things and space to be, to touch and be touched and doing it because it feels good being naked next to each other because it feels good, not because it's a prelude to sex. And when we schedule sexy time, and scheduling is key, by the way, because once you have responsibilities, once you have kids, you do have to schedule it. You have to prioritize it. Otherwise, urgent things will absolutely hijack your, your priority list. So you do have to schedule it, but take the goal of sex off the table. Make connection the goal. And that makes each person feel important to the other or to each other that you feel like because you're, pri you're prioritizing each other, you feel important to your partner. And that's an amazing aphrodisiac. Not the goal of sex, not I'm showing up to do this activity. I'm showing up for you and for me. I'm showing up for us. I'm showing, us, showing up for us as lovers not just parents, adults, partners, caretakers, but showing up to each other's lovers. That is infinitely more pleasurable, more connected, and ultimately more sustainable. It builds passion over time and makes sex something that you, you, know, you, you reach out for, you, you reach towards each other for. I love that. I love taking performance off the table. I think just naming it as performance, which is really how I felt throughout my marriage, yeah. you know, and, and I remember dating again after my divorce and the, the excitement of being with somebody new and having it be sex that I wanted, you know, rather yeah. than obligatory sex or yeah. peacekeeping sex or sex because he wanted it and he would be really grouchy if he didn't get it. And you know, and, and that's what happens so much in long-term relationships. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, so I love the take sex off the table, go out and have fun together and, and reignite the relationship and the connection mm -hmm. and without all the other roles that we take on over time, because mm -hmm. that can really be uh, not very sexy. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, this is the second myth in the myths that I talk about, which is that you know, if you're married and you love your husband, that sex and sexual desire should naturally happen. But the thing is that all these responsibilities, all these things that happen naturally in the, in the relationship when you have children, young children, and of course, even older children, that they shift the dynamic. And the myth is that because just because I love my husband, I should want to have sex with him. That again is, is dangerous because what ends up happening is women end up starving of the elements that would actually feed their libido. They're starving of the connection. They're starving of having a lover for a partner, not just a co-parent, not just a, a you know a, a co-partner co in the in the household, but a lover. And so they start to feel like they're broken. But the truth is that they're starving. They're missing these crucial elements of connection and playfulness and fun and, and spontaneity. And when I say that, I don't mean going to a bar and pretend like you don't know each other or buy sex toys. It's actually spontaneity as in your partner just reaching over and kissing you and kissing you, you know, more than that peck on the cheek, but like giving you a passionate kiss. Or, you know, reaching over in bed and snuggling up and just touching each other, touching each other uh, without any sexual agenda, but touching sexually too, just touching your bodies in a pleasurable way without trying to get off or get just to penetration or have an orgasm, but just touch because it's pleasurable to make out, to, to do all those things that kind of spontaneity gets missed. And again, it's something that she needs 
And without it, the thinking is a woman is broken or rather not realizing that those things are missing. It looks like she's broken, but the reality is that those are nutrients. Yeah. And the, you know, if she was a plant, the plant is struggling to grow because the nutrients are missing. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices, your smartphone, your tablet, your PC or Mac, Fire TV, and any Alexa-enabled devices like the Amazon Echo. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. It's just so important to, to realize what each person needs. I think that we often think that if I need this, then that person needs that. The same thing, mm -hmm. right? We mm -hmm. look at the world through our lens and not through their lens. And the more yeah. we can understand each other's needs, yeah. the more we can really connect more intimately. Yeah. So we have, we have two of these myths. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have others that you want to share? Yes. So the third one is related also to the way we function as modern women. And it's this myth that I'm a superwoman and I can do it all, right? I can take care of everyone and do an amazing job at work and come home and, and take care of the household. And I should be then able to come back, come, come to bed at night having done all of that and still be available sexually. And just, it, it makes me crazy even just saying it and naming it. Like we're not robots and we're not super women, although we are absolutely capable of super things and amazing things. We are like an engine that needs fuel. And if we spend all that fuel everywhere else and leave connection to our partners, connection to ourselves, sexual connection till the end of the night, you're naturally going to be empty on an empty tank. And again, so many women come to me thinking that they're sexually broken, where the reality is they're not sexually broken. They're running on an empty tank. They cannot spend all their life energy everywhere else like I said, saying yes to everything, doing everything, and then get pleasure and, and even just be available for sex when they have no life force left in them. And so, so much of this goes back to, or goes to the need for self-care, the need for connecting to yourself, to having space for yourself, to have spaciousness, to breathe, to have your favorite cup of tea, to, to connect to things that light you up, to fill your cup. And that's one of the biggest elements of women's libido is connection to pleasure, your own within yourself and with a partner. And you know the, the, the structure of, of a modern family is such that this has to happen because usually relatives live far away. So she's responsible for childcare she and her partner, but they're alone, right? They're doing something that took, used to take a village to do. And jobs these days with Zoom, it's wonderful that people can work from home, but also that work is now 24 seven, right? Work is at home for so many people. So it's being on all the time. And of course saying, like I said earlier, saying yes to all these things and draining her life energy. So we, when, when we work with libido, and this is, this is something that we need to start thinking about as a society, when we look at a woman's libido and, and we think she has low libido, quote unquote, we need to look at contextually what's happening. Who is she lower than or lower to compared to and what's happening in her life? And what kind of things does she need? What kind of things does she need to nourish herself and fill her up? 
And this is what the reason why I named my online program. I have a self-learning online program for women around libido. And I called it feed your libido because truly women are starving. Even women who do have sex, who are not in sexless marriages, when we get down to it, they're actually starving. They're performing. Yes, they enjoy some parts of it. But for so many women, sex is work. I have to get myself going. I have to get myself into it. I have to spend all this energy to enjoy it. And then at best, she comes out at, at zero. The thing is, we need to feed our libido so that it actually feeds us. So we come out not at zero. We come out as so much better, so much more alive and enlivened and um, having that feeling of you know, being unstoppable. Like, wow, I'm so open. I'm so you know, fluid and I'm unstoppable. That requires feeding your libido. So I'm, I'm thinking about, I have a married daughter who has three small children. And with the perspective that I have now, because I'm not her, but I used to be her, I keep trying to get her to do these things, to find time for creativity, for eating healthy, for exercising, for all the things that she often will neglect because she's so focused on being there for everybody else. And, you know, it's like you, you don't see the toll it takes until sometimes it's too late. And I watch her from my perspective, I can see the toll it's taking. She doesn't like to hear it from me because I'm her mom, <laughs> but, but it's like in hindsight, I can see what I did. I can see how, you know, all the things you're describing where I lost myself, I became a shell of who I was because I didn't know any different. Like I, I thought you just work really hard at trying to accommodate and that's how you make relationships better. Instead of, wow, this isn't working. We need to, I need to feed me, but I also need to have a relationship where somebody is open to, to hearing what I need. Mm -hmm. And I think that's often missing too. So let's talk a little bit about men's role here because I think a lot of times men don't really understand. And I remember going out with a guy once who he was very sexual. And on our first date, he was holding my hand the whole time, which I was okay with, you know, I can do that. And then he's like, you want to go into the bathroom and have sex now? And I'm like, no, I just met you five minutes ago. And, you know, it's just kind of joking around with him, but it was very aggressive. And the next thing I did, I got was like a, a, a text from him, are you, you know, are you busy? And it was a, you know, it was a booty call text. And so <laughs> I'm like, oh, what are you, why are you asking? And he said, well, I have some time, you know, do you want to come to my apartment now? So this guy was just all about that. And I said, no, that doesn't work for me, but I would like to have lunch with you sometime. Mm -hmm. And so we made an appointment to have lunch and the whole time it was all about, can I touch you? Can I do this? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, um, I just wrote an article for the Good Men Project, and it was all about what women need most. I said, do you want to guess what that is? <laughs> He's like, I have no idea. I said, we need, we need to feel safe. I don't feel safe yeah. with you. I said, so I, I do want to touch on that safety. And he was mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, totally get it. Totally mm -hmm. agree. And then I never saw him again. So um, <laughs> I mean, I was having fun. It, I didn't do anything I did that I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And I was very honest and open with him. I think that men don't understand what that safety means and how to create it. So I'd love to hear your, your take on that. Yes, this is such a key piece also in my work is creating that safety. And like you said, yes, men don't understand it because men, because of the testosterone, they don't actually think of safety as, as a concern. It's not. They have so much more testosterone than women that even the smallest men, like in terms of the, 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 the build, um, he has more testosterone. And so naturally he feels safe. Whereas women, we, are, we have far less testosterone. We have far less generally strength. And we, it's wired in us to pay attention to that safety. And, understand, and men don't understand that. They, they only see the world through their own eyes, right? But here's where our role comes in. We have to use 
our voice to create that safety for ourselves. And the way to do it is not to build walls or to push men away, but to ask for what we need and to stand in that request, stand in our truth and not say yes to things that we're a no to. When we ask for what we need, of course, we can explain also to men what's happening, why we're doing this. But just in the, in the act of asking for what we need, we take care of ourselves and then create a context where they can show up to, to co-create that safety with us. But it has to be co-created. We have to initiate because the way um, what happens in relationships is men lead the sexual piece and women lead the relationship piece. But it's actually vice versa. We need to lead the sexual piece. We need to let men know what we're available for and what we're not before they initiate and we have to reject them. Mm because it actually puts us in a dangerous dynamic. If we wait for him to initiate and then we reject him, well, he just went out of, of, on a limb. He did something vulnerable, right? He put himself out there. He said what he wanted. And we have to say, no, I don't want that, right? Push him away. That puts us in a more vulnerable position versus us leading the conversations about sex, leading what we're available with and what we're not using our voice, doing that, that we create then a space where he can show up. He knows what's safe. Oh, it's safe to initiate kissing with her, but she's not going to be a yes to sex. So I'm not going to propose that. And that actually sets both people up for success. It sets the woman up to feel safe and it sets the man up to win with her, to know exactly what she's available for and provide that. And it's the same with relationships. We usually lead with relationships, um, but we need the men to let us know what they're available for so we can set up our own expectations around that. So it still actually comes down to you asking what the man is available for a relationship. What are you available for? Are you, are you really truly available for a relationship or is your vision right now seeing each other once in a while, playing, kind of having that kind of light relationship, what is it that you're available for? And these kind of conversations have to happen very early on. I would, I, I very radical in this way, but I say it, it needs to happen in the phone call before your first date, right? Don't go see someone that you don't know whether they're available for something or if they're okay with your availability around sex. And one more thing I'll say about availability with sex is also I'm very radical in this piece. I recommend putting off sex till, till you have enough of a sense that you feel safe with a partner. And that sets you up to have sex in a different way and to, to have your needs met, right? To get those nourishments that you need. But it also allows you to stay sober to stay sober while all these signs are coming your way and you get a chance to see which are yellow, which are yellow flags and which are red flags and to act appropriately. Because sex is an amazing thing. It takes us to a whole different way of being, but it's also intoxicating and it dulls our ability to see things for the, the way they are. I so agree. I am such an advocate for speaking up and knowing yourself and knowing what you want. And, and I, I see all the time in my Facebook group, women have sex early on, and then they're posting in the group. I'm not sure if he's exclusive. I don't know if he shut his profile yeah. down. I don't know what he's looking for. Freaking ask him, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and they're so afraid of finding out the truth, but they've already made themselves so vulnerable. And then it becomes so much harder. Yeah. 
And so. it's like, we're so afraid. We're so afraid of speaking up, but it's so much worse to not speak up. I mean, mm -hmm. I spent my whole life not speaking up. So this is my Been passion now, right? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. thinking it's too, it's too scary. And what if he doesn't want what I want? Well, then that's good. That's good to know. And, but some people will say they want something, which is also why taking your time to, to see if it's true that he really mm -hmm. is behaving as if he wants a relationship. You can say a lot of things. I'm a kind person. I'm loving. I'm these things. And then they behave completely differently. Once you have sex, you can't see any of that anymore. You're totally fuzzy, not thinking clearly. Yeah. Especially if you're a woman. Yes. yes. Those chemicals are so strong. Mm -hmm. The oxytocin, it makes us absolutely uh blind to these things we start to rationalize oh it's not a big deal and and it is a big deal yeah and and yeah it doesn't on, it's not going to honor you in the end and it's gonna uh, yeah all yeah. sorts of negative things <laughs> it's so true and and i've seen men really become obsessed and mm -hmm. get bonded so quickly as well. Yeah. I think it happens more commonly with women, but I have seen men who, who become like crazy after a breakup. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking of somebody now who just keeps trying to find a way back into this woman's mm -hmm. life. And she's told him in so many ways, no, I'm not, it's, this isn't working. I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And now he's just pushing every boundary, which is really not okay. Yeah. So, you know, just um, the takeaways that, that I have from this beautiful conversation is women are not broken. <laughs> um, we need to be clear about what we want. We need to make time for each other. We need to make time away from sex as a performance, but really connect more deeply to desire and to passion and um, into getting to know our bodies, to, to not rejecting our bodies. I, I see so much yeah. self-loathing around body type and we didn't even get into that, but I think, you know, sex isn't about having a perfect body. And yeah, if you could just say something about that, because I think so many people listening think they have to be 10 pounds thinner to have sex again. And, you know, that men are going to reject them because they have cellulite or any of these other crazy crazy things that women tell themselves as another brokenness. Um, yeah, if you can leave women with a positive message about sex and body image. Yeah, yeah I'd love to. And it also speaks to my own journey because I've, I've struggled with weight all my life. And mm. you know, in the beginning, I thought, well, I'm not fuckable, right? I'm not, I'm not worthy of sex because of you know, the stomach rolls or the way I look. And my own journey around pleasure really changed the way I understand sexuality and, and see sex and see body image. And that's, and here's, here's how it plays out. If sex is about performance, then of course you want to have a certain body shape. You want to come across a certain way. You want to leave a certain impression about yourself, but ultimately that's not about you enjoying it. You coming alive through it, you getting nourished. And the antidote to negative body image and the, the effects of it on your sex life is to connect to the pleasure in your body. My own journey was actually, you know, with, with the stomach rolls that I mentioned is starting to touch my body and realize, wow, there is so much pleasure in my belly. It's one of the most pleasurable neurotic parts of my body. And when I literally touched into it, when I started touching and feeling that pleasure and that sensuality, it turned my impression of my own body into, wow, I have this beautiful thing that is capable of such tremendous pleasure. And literally it's like, like I changed glasses and saw things differently. And so that's the journey. And it's really a journey. It's not just a, only a mindset change, but it's a journey of exploring your body and connecting to its pleasure that's going to change your mindset, that's going to open the door to enjoying yourself, enjoying your body, connecting to yourself, getting so much more out of it 
than trying to shape it, kind of contain it, uh, mold it. That's going to, that's, that's takes a lot of work and it's going to get you into sex. That's going to take even more work. This is more about receiving and nourish, getting nourished and absorbing and, and coming alive. That's really the, the, the message I want to impart here that this way of experiencing your own body is about coming alive in it. I love that. I, and, you know, you've said many times that libido is your life force. Yeah. And we don't really look at it as that. We think of it as it's our turn on, it's, it's being lubricated, it's being ready for performance, right? Mm -hmm. And if we see it as life force, then see your body as life force because yeah. your body is life force. I mean, it's, it is incredible. I mean, I, I gave birth to several children. I have grandchildren. Yeah. I have so much has come from the fruit of my body and I still yeah. continue to nourish others and nourish myself. And we, we make ourselves crazy with the self-loathing and the feeling of obligation instead mm -hmm. of connecting to what, what brings me joy, what turns me on, what brings me pleasure. Yeah. I, I think that's just such an important mindset shift. And mm -hmm. hopefully our listeners will take away some of these very important messages. Yeah. Um, and, and I want to add one more thing too uh, about men in this, that so much of what we do is driven by wanting to impress men, be, be pleasant to men, to keep men. But ultimately, performance and showing up in this perfect form provides literally like a cardboard cake for them. Like it looks good, right? There's like, it looks like a real cake, but once they bite into it, it's cardboard. It doesn't taste good and it has absolutely no nutritional value. That when we can connect to ourselves, when we can be ourselves, when we come alive, now that's nourishment for men. That's what men want. They don't know how to ask for it because they're asking for sex, thinking that that's what's going to get, it, get them that. And I also have an article on my blog about that, how men and women initiate sex differently or communicate their interest in sex differently. So I invite uh, listeners to check it out. Um, but it, it, men want sex because they want that nourishment too. They want to partake in her energy, her aliveness, her self-confidence, her enjoying herself. But they miss when they just ask for sex. <laughs> But ultimately, that's what's nourishing for all of us. It's that self-connection, connection to each other, that aliveness. I love it. Wow. This has been an amazing conversation. And I'm just, my, I'm all like excited about like thoughts about sharing with my community and, and really helping women um, and ways that they can go and check out what you offer. Um, I'd love to get the links to the blog posts so then we can put mm -hmm. those in the show notes and if you can let people know how to find you and um you know find your programs that would be great tell us absolutely so everything is on my website which is irenefair.com i-r-e-n-e-f as in frank e-h-r and yes there's a wealth of blogs uh, around uh or on the topics of women's libido and sexless marriages because that's primarily who come to me for in terms of there's a, a lot of information about sexless marriages because that's really my area of expertise in my coaching practice but there's all these different articles about understanding each other men and women understanding how we speak different languages and what do we actually mean and how do we communicate what we need and i also have a free three video training on my website called how to want to have sex again this is a super powerful training for women to understand a lot of these myths that I talked about and how they play out. It's very informational, packed with charts and tables and kind of a geek out on, on women's <laughs> libido. Um, and I also have the Feed Your Libido online program. And that's all linked from my website as, of course, information on coaching with me for single women and for couples. 
Awesome. Well, thanks again, Irene, for coming on and sharing this important information with my audience. Thank you so much for having me. I'd love this conversation. Very rich and, and engaging. I agree. And uh, for all our listeners, if you love our show, the way to support us is to leave a, a, a good review on Apple Podcasts is probably the best place. And uh, that helps us to get wonderful guests like Irene to the show and to continue bringing this excellent content. And we hope you go on your last first date very soon. <laughs>